good afternoon to everybody and welcome to today's uh, not-for-profit speaker series with Cherry Becker. We welcome uh, those back for this, our section, session number six of our speaker series for 2023. Uh, so uh, we will be getting started in just one moment. If you uh, are joining us for the first time, uh, just a reminder, you can go out and see our previous five sessions at our website at cbh.com. Maddie's dropping a link in there to that uh, down in the chat box. So please feel free to visit that site, bookmark it, and uh, you can get to our previous sessions. And you can also see our upcoming sessions as well and get registered for those uh, future not-for-profit series sessions. So we have a great uh, topic here today, a guest speaker uh, speaking on HR and total rewards trends, which is a very hot topic uh, at the moment. Before we get to introducing our speaker, uh, I'd like to uh, go over just some housekeeping items for today's session. So just as a reminder, uh, if you are wanting CPE credit for this, uh, you must answer at least three of the four polling questions that are gonna be uh, launched today over the next 50 minutes to an hour. Uh, please make sure to answer at least three of those. We'll give you about a minute uh, on each of them, but then we need to move on and close out the poll. You'll get a CPE certificate within about 10 days uh, to your email that you use to register. Uh, if you do not see that or you haven't received it, uh, please feel free to reach out to our team at cbhlearning at cbh.com. And again, uh, recorded versions will be posted to that link that was shared in the chat. Uh, you can always go back and relook at uh, recorded versions of this if you want to go back. Uh, and if you have any questions throughout this, which I'm sure there may be some, given the topic, uh, please drop those into the Q&A window and we'll be monitoring those and uh, asking uh, Becky to answer any of those questions as we do the presentation. Uh, so with that short survey at the end of the webinar, please fill that out for our future uh, purposes. Um, but that leaves our housekeeping. I'm just going to go in and introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, so we have Becky Groves with us. Becky is a recurring speaker and backed by, uh, by popular demand. And uh, Becky is now in her own HR consulting firm since the last time she joined us. So congratulations, Becky, for that. Um, but Becky is uh, a compensation and human resources consultant. Uh, now the founder of Gorilla HR, and she is uh, has you know, extensive experience over career working at a variety of different organizations in a human resources capacity prior to now moving into the consulting space. So she started Gorilla HR to focus on job analysis and documentation, conducting market studies, creating salary structures, and performing equity analysis for employees and employers. Uh, she's a certified Compensation professional, a certified senior professional in human resources, and a SHRM senior certified professional as well. That's a whole lot of certifications. And uh, Becky, we're so glad to have you right now. What is what a subject, what a world we've got. The Writers Guild on strike. We've got all sorts of uh, things going on in the world of compensation and workers' benefits and all that kind of stuff. And I know that this is certainly something that all of us are dealing with uh, right now. So glad to have you, welcome and uh, take it away. Awesome, thank you. I am so happy to be back chatting with the group today. I totally welcome interruptions and questions. So please do use that chat. If there's something you wanna chime in on at any point, feel free. I'll keep monitoring that, but I would love to hear from you. So feel free to interrupt me anytime you need to. So we are going to talk about some trends in the workplace in general, and then talk about some things that we can do around total rewards to help combat that situation a little bit. It is a crazy time, and it is really something where so many organizations just keep saying like, all right, when are things going to slow down? When are things going to get easy? And I don't see that happening anytime soon, but we're going to talk about some things that will hopefully give you some ideas to hope, hopefully make it a little bit easier for you. We are actually going to start with a poll question. And so the first question that I have for you is what is your biggest business challenge? And right now, a lot of the things that I'm hearing from employers are related to concerns about inflation, talent acquisition, regulatory compliance, because we've got a lot of new stuff happening in that area, or maybe it's something else altogether. 
So I'm going to let you take a moment, think about your biggest challenge. If you put other, I would love to know what it is. So certainly feel free in the chat. If you want to tell me if you're in that other space, what it is that is of concern to you. While that question is running, I'm going to just talk about myself for a little bit since I've got this captive audience. <laughs> So a lot of people ask me about Gorilla HR and they say, why Gorilla? And so when I think about Gorilla, it is really about guerrilla warfare. It's about doing things different and it's about being more nimble. And it's about people who are kind of in the trenches and have that really um, adaptable ideas and equipment and technology to be able to change and do things against something where there's a really solid, established, slow bureaucratic process and system. And so I love the concept of guerrilla HR in the sense that we all need to be able to be nimble and react to our changing environment, particularly when it comes to our workplaces. And so speaking of changing environments and what's up top of mind, it looks like talent acquisition is the top response. I see 50% are concerned about talent acquisition. 30% have said that inflation is important um, or is their biggest challenge. I say they're all important, but their biggest challenge. And there are quite a few in the other. I see a few that are talking about um, some in religions. Um, that's interesting. I see a comment that talks about the Methodist church. And so some divisive um, things that are happening there within the Methodist church. So that's creating some challenges for them. In higher education, I see enrollment is an issue. So I, I definitely can understand some of these different challenges challenges that we're seeing as employers, um, just with the different things that are happening in our workplaces. I will say you are all not alone. There are a lot of different survey sources out there. We'd love to ask people what's going on and what is giving you a headache and keeping you up at night. And one of the most common things is talent acquisition. So honestly, I'm not surprised to see that 50% said that that's really their biggest issue is getting people. That is followed by talent retention and cost of materials in a lot of the surveys that we've seen. Um, general worker shortage, another survey, this one is not shared with you on the screen, but another survey just in general said that worker shortage is their biggest issue. So there are a lot of different things that we can do. What the data is showing us is that right now a lot of employers are responding to these challenges by adjusting pay ranges. And I could talk about pay all day long. So when we talk about adjusting pay ranges, we really need to be thinking about what is the true market rate for a job. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. We'll come back and talk about that comp piece a little bit more. The other thing employers are doing is really looking at the retention side of things. So on the retention side, it's like once you've got that employee, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep them. And then the last piece of that, which really to me is a direct tie into that retention piece, is focusing on training and development. And again, we'll come a little bit deeper into some of that as we move throughout the session. So let's talk about where are the workers. One of the things that I often hear from employers is they say, nobody wants to work anymore. And maybe y'all can relate. Maybe you've heard this before. So maybe you are thinking that everybody is at home sitting on mom and dad's couch. They're in their 20s. They should be getting out in the workforce and they're just not doing it. They're staying at home and they're just not going to get a real job. They're not going to do it. And so some people think that's where everybody is. They just don't want to work. Or we heard during COVID, a lot of employers said, well, people can make more money sitting at home on unemployment. And so they're not coming back. Well, the data shows us that that wasn't really true, but that time is long gone. So all of those loosened requirements around unemployment, that is all far long gone away. And so what we have really found is that if we look at the data around labor utilization, which is the data that tells us if people have a job or people who are looking for jobs, are they actually getting them? When we look at those numbers around labor utilization, we are less than 1% difference than we were pre-COVID. So when we talk about nobody wants to work, it's the exact same. We're really within 1% of where we were before COVID began. So it's not that people don't want to work. It's that people are working in different ways. And then, of course, there simply is a lack of qualified workers for many jobs that we have. There are just simply more jobs than people. So definitely a simple supply and demand issue. But I just wanted to clear up that, that misconception that nobody wants to work. That's really just not the case. Some of the other conceptions that we have about workers is that people are job hoppers. I think that no matter what actual generation somebody's in, whether they're a Gen X or a millennial or maybe they're Gen Z, there's this idea that those youngsters, they just bounce around and they don't stay with an employer. 
And some of you may be thinking, yeah, that's, that's true. Nobody wants to stay. Nobody works. The fact is the numbers haven't really changed. So whatever group we call it, whether it's millennials, Gen X, et cetera, et cetera, if we look at the data, about 44% of those younger workers, those younger workers being ages 18 to 34, 44% of them have been with their employer for three or more years. So 44% have been there three years or longer. On the other side of that, 40% of those workers ages 18 to 34 have been with their employer for 12 months or less. So to me, that says that time when you first get somebody in that first year is really critical in creating a relationship that an employee wants to stay. And so what we are finding with that data is it has not changed since the 1980s. So that is a long time ago. So 1980s, not 20 years ago, like, like some of you may, may think. So since the 80s, those numbers haven't changed. So there is not a difference in people who are bouncing around and coming and going. It's the exact same as it has been for the last 40 years. So that's definitely another misconception that we have. We also have heard a lot, of course, about the great resignation or the great upgrade. I think some of the trends are starting to slow down a little bit. We're not hearing quite as much, but there are still people who are out there looking for jobs. Um, the most recent data I have, it's actually from 2022. There was a Mercer study and it said that one in three people are looking for new jobs. One in three. Can you imagine if a third of your workforce just up and got a new job and was out the door either today or within two weeks, that would probably be pretty, uh, pretty impactful on your organization. And so we need to be aware that those, those things are still happening where people are out there because they have a lot of different options when it comes to working. So misconceptions, again, labor utilization is where we were pre-COVID. People are not job hopping any more today than they did 40 years ago. And there are just different opportunities for people and people are actually looking to take advantage of those different opportunities. So that's one of the things that we're seeing as far as where is everybody? Why can't I find anyone to hire? I wanna switch gears just a little bit and we're gonna do another poll here. And this one is really gonna be around caregiving. So what I want to know from you is who else are you taking care of? Do you have children under the age of 18? Do you have children over the age of 18 that are dependent on you or that you're caring for? Do you have aging parents that you're caring for or none of the above? Who are we taking care of? Hey, Becky, I was looking for the all of the above <laughs> option too, because I know certainly that is... Uh... That is the case for some people. I mean, they check all yeah. three of those categories, right? Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny you say that. I often say, I, I don't have children. I make no moans about it. Like all my children are animals. So I have goats and I have a dog and those are all of my babies. And I see even my own family. My brother has um, two girls and my nieces who I adore. But there are times when I think, oh my gosh, like how do people do it all? You know, how do you work and parent. And then now we also have to throw in that aging parent stage. I'm in that phase now where my own parents are getting older and my in-laws are getting older. And so it is definitely something that is at top of mind for a lot of people right now. But I agree, we've got kind of the sandwich generation where people have both. They have both the kids and the parents. Yeah, I'll be excited to see what, what's happening, what everybody else has to say. Yeah, I've got a few people in the chat too saying siblings too. And uh, where's the all, the all of the above? So definitely. Yes, yes. Yeah, I should have had the all of the above. I apologize for that. That, <laughs> that would have been a good one here. But yeah, what I see here is that we see 32% are taking care of kids under the age of 18. 10% are caring for kids over 18. 21% are dealing with aging parents. And we do have 36% that are none of the above. And then of course, there's probably that mix of all of the above. <laughs> So we definitely have a mix there. So all these folks that are caring for people, they are not alone. And that is one of the biggest barriers to employment. And one of the things that is having an impact when it comes to people who maybe want to work, but they're unable to. So when we actually look at the data around people who leave jobs, there was a study that came out in 2022 by Pew Research. And the number four reason that people quit their jobs was because of childcare issues. They didn't have the ability, they didn't have the flexibility to make sure that their kids were cared for. And so that was a reason a lot of people had to leave jobs. So certainly that caregiving can be a barrier for many people. 
There's also a study out there that AARP did, and it says that nearly one in five people are providing unpaid care to an adult that has some sort of health or um, whether it's a mental or physical disability, there's some sort of fun functional, daily functional support that they need. So one in five are providing care to an adult. 24% are actually caring for more than one person. So we've got a lot of people who are responsible for those caregiving duties. And they've also told us that it's getting harder. People are finding that it's becoming more and more difficult to coordinate care. So if they need to have somebody else come in, and who's assisting to provide support so that maybe somebody can go to work, those things are becoming a lot harder. I know even I've experienced that in, in looking to get care for a parent and trying to find somebody who could come in and help with some you know, basic duties on a regular basis. And it was really tough for us to find somebody to be able to do that. That is having an impact on workers in a variety of different ways. So for a lot of folks that are caregiving, 23% of them had said that caring for somebody else is having an impact on their own health, and it's having a negative impact on their own health. So we can see that caring for other people has an impact certainly on the way we feel, but it also has an impact on our wallet. So a AARP found that those caregivers are spending 26% of their income on activities related to caregiving. So if you think about it, not only do you have the challenges of caring for somebody else, you have the physical toll on yourself, but there's also a pretty significant financial impact. You know, 26% is nothing to sneeze at. So that's quite a big portion of income that individuals are spending towards those caregiving activities. So that's certainly something that we need to think about as employers when we look at the caregiving concerns that people have. That is certainly creating some barriers for folks. There are some other things I want to touch on here as well. So in addition to the caregiving, we also have transportation issues. You know, for some folks, they are not in a place where there is amazing public transportation. I was recently working with a client in the Raleigh area. And so I wanted to look at the distance and I just picked places. I picked the location of their office from the NC State campus. And when I pulled it up, the directions that it gave me, if I were to drive it, it was 13 miles and it would take 20 minutes. And so you're like, okay, if you've got a car that you can get back and forth, that's great. But what if somebody had to take transportation? So to get that same 13 mile using public transportation in Raleigh, it would take, hold on, let me find my time, one hour and 21 minutes. It would involve two buses and 18 minutes of walking. So if you're thinking about, well, why can't somebody just show up and get to work? If they don't have reliable transportation and they are not in a place that has good public transportation, it can be really challenging. And it can also be really expensive. My car is not even broken. My car, my car is a great car and it's not anything fancy. But just this week, I did some service on my car, 80,000 mile you know, general maintenance service. It was nearly $1,000. So I spent nearly $1,000 for a car that wasn't broken. And so when you think about other folks that you know, may be looking at transportation and how to get somewhere, it can certainly still be a barrier because we, we can't always get places. So certainly something that we still need to be cognizant of. One of the other things that we also see is the individuals who are justice involved in some way. So this, this statistic is, it blew my mind when I saw it. One in three American adults either have an arrest or a conviction record. And so obviously an arrest is not a conviction, but when you pull that report and if you're doing a background check on somebody, you're going to see that arrest there. And so one in three arrested or convicted of a crime, and that's certainly going to have an impact and create a barrier for some folks to be able to get a job. In fact, 27% of those with a criminal record are unemployed. So nearly, or actually just over a quarter of folks that do have a criminal record are unable to get a job. Now, certainly there are some people with a criminal record that I wouldn't want to work with either. You know, I totally get that. If you have something that's really egregious or violent, you know, you're not going to work with that person. You know, if you're in healthcare, you're working with kids, obviously there's going to be some different requirements there. But when we think about the criminal aspect of it, of course, I would always encourage people to be compliant with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so that's going to tell us that when we do come up with that information, we do see those records, we're not going to just automatically disqualify that applicant. But instead, what we need to do is we need to be consistent in evaluating what's happened. We need to think about the nature of the crime. What was it? How bad was it? When did it happen? 
And does it apply to the job that somebody's working towards? You know, is it something that might have an impact on the position that they're actually, uh, excuse me, will it have an impact on the position that they're actually applying for or trying to do? So we need to be aware of all of these different barriers. So even though, again, we're saying, where is everybody? There are some things we just need to be aware of that may be preventing them from being able to work and to be able to contribute in ways that they want to. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the things that we can do in order to attract and retain people. So we know that we're having a hard time. We've looked at some of the barriers that are making the availability of workers a little bit tougher, but let's look at some of the things that we can do to try to overcome that. The first thing that I'm gonna talk about is around pay. So I already mentioned that Pew study that said the number four reason people left jobs was because they had difficulty with, with caregiving responsibilities and being able to provide childcare for their kids. Well, the number one reason was pay. So that tells us that we really need to be thinking about what are we paying people? You know, for many people, the pay is why they work. Certainly it's not the only reason. I know for myself, it's never been the only reason, but it is really important. And for a lot of employers, it's also often their biggest expense. So the pay piece is really critical. One of the things that I want to mention, though, is that we often hear people talk about changes in the cost of living, and we relate that to employment and what we have to pay for workers, so what we would call the cost of labor. But that cost of labor and that cost of living are not the same thing. Those are two very different numbers. So when we're talking about the cost of living, that's essentially what we have to pay for a basket of goods. What does it cost to pay for rent or a mortgage? What does it cost to buy milk, eggs, gas, et cetera? And so that number, that um, consumer price index is used by Social Security, and they use that to come up with a cost of living index. And they use that number to give an increase. And so the goal when that was initially established is that then people who are on Social Security and receiving those funds, that their dollars still go far enough to pay for the things that they need. And so when we look at that, that is not the same as what we're going to see and changes in what we're going to pay people. Now that trend is going to have an impact. That cost of living trend is something that's going to trail what we see as far as changes in the cost of labor, but it's not direct. So as we see the cost of living go up, Typically, we will see a response where workers are demanding higher wages, and we will see the cost of labor, what we have to pay people, go up, but it tends to lag by a couple of years. And so what we're seeing when we look at cost of living, again, that Social Security number, they're giving some of the biggest increases that we've had in a really long time. So this year, that 8.7% cost of living increase was the largest it has been since 1981. And so some employees saw that, they heard that number, maybe they know maybe they know people who are getting social security and they heard, hey, they're getting 8.7% increase in their cost of living through their social security. So where's my 8.7% pay increase? And that is just simply not the way that it works. Of course, they probably weren't coming to you in you know, 2021 and saying, hey, where's my 1.3% increase? Or where's my 1.6% increase? You know, but when we see those bigger, bigger numbers, people are aware of it. And so that's where they come looking for it. But the reality on the cost of labor side is that we're seeing numbers now that are closer to 4%. And that is a big increase from what we've seen in the past. If we look historically across the last 20 years, overall, what we've seen as far as wages and the cost of labor, that increase is about 2.5%. And it's about 2.5% for if we look at the last 10 years and the last five years as well. But when we look just over the last year, that's where now we see that 4% number, and it's a lot bigger. I was honestly a little surprised to see 2.5 when I looked at this data. You know, I would have just rounded and said 3%. I would have said that for years we could say, hey, 3% is what, what employers are going to give as far as increases. And it's really a little bit higher for the recent year and actually a little bit lower historically. So I was a little bit surprised by that number. When we look to the future, um, that 4% number, I think it's going to stay. I have talked to some employers who say, ah, oh, things are cooling off. And if we don't see as much increase in the cost of living, we're going to see a smaller increase in the cost of labor. But I think given the shortage of workers that we have and the low unemployment numbers that we have, that number is really not going not to change. I think it's going to stay around 4% for probably a while. <laughs> Excuse me. 
All right, let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about variable pay. So, sorry guys. All right, I know I hate it when people do that, I'm so sorry. All right, I'm good now. All right, variable pay. So throughout COVID, and as we continue to see this lack of workers come in, we saw certainly an increase in the number of employers that were offering some kind of variable pay to employees. I think variable pay is definitely here to stay. And I think it can be a very effective tool in order to reward workers. So on the slide, you'll see that there are about 30% of employers telling us that they're giving hiring bonuses, 17% were giving stay bonuses, and 65% were giving some other kind of annual bonus. One of my other data sources says that overall, it's about 78% of employers that are using some kind of variable pay, whether hiring stay annual, um, that could also be a referral bonus, it could be discretionary bonuses. There are a lot of different ways that an employer could provide some kind of variable pay. Now, I love variable pay as a tool to reward workers. What you need to think about, though, is the behavior that you're trying to get from those employees. When you have some kind of variable pay and you're trying to get someone to do something, maybe it's you know a different way of working or working faster or more efficiently, you want to make sure that the behaviors that you're rewarding don't have unintended consequences. And that can be a really difficult thing for employers because when they're implementing variable pay, you get so focused on the one thing that you're after. And so you don't necessarily stop and really pick it apart and say, are we going to get the things we really want out of this? And so I won't throw any names out there, but there was a bank a couple of years ago that got in trouble because some tellers were opening credit card accounts for different members of the bank who didn't necessarily want those cards. But if you look at what was being rewarded, those individuals were being rewarded for opening accounts. I'm not saying it was the right thing to do at all. Of course, that's not the right thing to do. But when you look at the behaviors, that behavior is what was getting that incentive. And so that's what people chose to do. And so you really need to stop and say, what are we after? What are we trying to get when we offer that variable pay? You know, I see some where they are offering some kind of um, like a stay bonus. And here we see 17% of employers have. When you think about that, what do you want the employees to do? Is it just to stay? How long are they going to stay? If you give some sort of incentive or some kind of a bonus just for simply being there, what does that message say? Is it that your base pay isn't strong enough? Are they going to stay for the you know three months or six months that you ask them to stay after giving them that stay bonus? Or do you need to spend those funds in a different way to improve the overall work environment so that people aren't necessarily looking to leave? So I think you have to be cautious that when we talk about variable pay, it's not simply throw money at a problem, but make sure that you're solving for an identified issue. So it can be very effective. You just have to pause and think and make sure you do, do things the right way. Also along the lines of pay, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of right now is a really a lot of discussion around pay equity. And I love this topic. So I love pay equity in the sense of looking externally at market data, but I also like the idea of looking internally to see what our organization's doing to make some changes. I do see a question on variable pay and I'll come back to that in just a moment. When it comes to pay equity, one of the things that we've asked employers is, is it something that you're concerned about? And you can see on the slide there that about 50% said that they're really not concerned. And that means that the other 50% are either seriously concerned or they have some concern, even if it's not very strong. I think everybody should have some concern about this. I think that pay equity is an issue. I think the data supports that there's a problem here and I don't think it's gonna go away. And I think in the sense that we're seeing more action both legally as well as from employees and what we're hearing from the actual workers is that this, this is not gonna change. This is not something that we can just say, oh, I'm not worried about pay equity. So I'm kind of surprised 50% said they're not concerned because I think that they should be. So for those that are concerned, what are they actually doing about it? So one of the things that we can do is simply an internal audit. And so that's where we're going in. We're looking at our salaries and wages and looking to see, are they competitive? And so are the things that you're offering them 
competitive internally against each other? And are they competitive externally against other similar positions in similarly situated organizations? Some organizations are looking to establish formal structures. And so for some companies, you know, maybe they're smaller and they say, all right, we're going to hire Becky's neighbor. Let's pay him 50000 Oh, my neighbor's kid, you know, is looking for a part-time job. Oh, let's bring him in and pay him $16 an hour. And so we see people where they really don't have any kind of structure or plan in place. And so when that happens, there's a lot of room where there might be some inequity because there's not a structure, there's not a process or a procedure that guides how we actually make pay decisions. And we don't want to do that. That's where having a formal structure in place can help us come up with a plan or a system that says, this is the job, this is what we've evaluated, and this is what we've determined its worth is, and that's what we're going to pay for. We also see more organizations that are doing that external market pricing. And so that's where you're going to go out and maybe it's looking for um, different data sources to find out what's the going rate. And this is something that I love, you know, working with employers to do because a lot of the people say, well, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to find this data. Fortunately, there are a lot of really robust data sources out there, but there are also some really uh, bad data sources out there. So sometimes I think that, um, meth, you know, the motto of you get what you pay for, it, it applies here as well. So you do need to be cautious about some of that crowdsource data. If you're going out and you have information where everybody's just putting in some kind of rate, it's not statistically sound, it's not validated, you don't know if they were matching based on just a title or based on a job description, that's the kind of stuff we want to avoid. But we want to look to sources, to sources where we have employer-reported data based on duties and responsibilities and not just titles. And that's what will help us figure out what do we need to be paying in order to be competitive against the market. We also have organizations that internally are looking to figure out what do we need to do for an equity analysis. And that's where then we're looking at other factors, things like race and ethnicity and gender, and figuring out do we have some gaps where perhaps we have some disparity in the way that we're paying these different groups of people. Matt, I see you just pop back up. Is there a question? Yeah, I just saw one question kind of going back to the last slide on variable pay. Just kind of wondering when you get into like this variable pay and, and some of these bonuses, whether it's retention or just uh, that kind of thing, how do you, it's a slippery slope. How do you ever get out of it? I mean, how do you, how do you stop it without people feeling like um, they're getting paid less for the same, same job now all of a sudden? Um, that one just been kind of having that issue, people working less shifts and now they're going to temp workers and it's more expensive. Just any advice there? Yeah, for sure. So I think the first part of it is, you know, how do you stop it? So I think that comes back to the idea of what is the problem that you're solving for? So if the problem is it's a shift differential and you can't get people and so paying some sort of variable pay or maybe offering, you know, that, that incentive for that, if it's working and it's solving the need, then I would continue. But if you found that the conditions have changed and you don't need to do that anymore, then certainly you could stop it. In this situation, if not paying that variable pay or not offering that additional incentive is now making you not as competitive and so people are not coming to work there, then I would say maybe you can't stop it. You know, maybe you still need to have that in place in order to solve for that issue of getting the workers that you need. So I think it's really making sure you're identifying, you know, what is that issue? One of the things we saw during COVID, you know, certainly employers who had people who had to come to work, some of those essential workers, that's where we saw because of the, you know, safety concerns and those conditions, employers maybe offered some supplemental income to those folks is, you know, not, not necessarily the direct safety. I mean, certainly employers were taking precautions to keep people safe, but they were saying there's a little bit more hazard as far as our work environment right now. And so here's something extra. And then as those conditions change and things got a little bit more under control, then employers can say, okay, we no longer have to pay that additional premium for that because that, that environmental condition is not the same. Perfect, thank you. Got, got another question here um, relating kind of to the, the issue of compensation and pay increases to kind of coming back to your cost of labor, cost of living kind of issues. What about, what about market trends and increases too. So often we see this, you know, folks get hired, could be a certain region or a certain type of job. Certainly we see this in the accounting business right now where market rates are really kind of rapidly increasing more than um, 
more than sort of the the cost of labor rates or the the the, the cost of living rates. How do you yeah. um how do you address that when sort of you you've got incoming people that you got to adjust to market, but then you know, but you've got an entire workforce that uh, all of a sudden now has some uh, pay differential or, or equity issues. I mean, how how are employers dealing with that kind of issue of just market market rate? Oh, there are so many good pieces in that question. Okay, so let's start with the first part. The first part is really just market market pay. What is happening in the market? And you are exactly right that even if we have a general trend, like we say 4% or we say 2.5%, not every job is moving at that rate. And so certainly there are other jobs where there are bigger increases over time. And so when we have market data, if we go out, we look at those different data sources and we find out what, what are other employers paying for a similar, similar job, then we have the step to say, okay, I have to pay that new accountant you know, that person who just came out of school, you know, maybe a few years ago, I was paying them 50000 to come in. And now they're looking for sixty two, just to even set foot in the door on day one, right? Things have changed. Meanwhile, you have people who have been there for a couple of years that maybe you brought in at 50. Have they gotten increases that got them up to 62? Mm, probably not, you know, unless you're giving some pretty hefty increases each year. And so when we have that market data, one, we're using it to say, what do we need to pay to bring in new people? But then we do have to stop and we have to look internally. So that's where we often have a compression issue where we have to bring in new hires at a higher rate because the conditions have changed. The supply of workers has changed. And so we have to pay more to get them in. But then you have this person that's been working for a few years and they're at a lower rate. So there are two different facets to that. So one is going to be the compliance piece of if we have people doing similar jobs, then equal pay for equal work. And so we need to evaluate what's different. And we may need to make some market adjustments. And we may need to say, we've got to bring that person up because those people are doing similar work. So we need to have similar pay. The other piece of that is of course the employee relations side of it. If I've been working for you for five or 10 years and I know that you're bringing in new people a whole lot higher than me, I'm going to be ticked off. I'm going to be like, where is my money? And so I, I get it. And so that is where, as an, an organization, you have to determine what is the value of that individual? What happens if that person leaves? Because now they know they can go get more money and they're going to get, you know, a 10 or 15 or 20% increase if they go work for the person next door. Whereas I only want to give them three or 4% a year. You know, am I okay just saying, hey, I'm giving you three or 4% and that's it. And that's what we can afford. And I understand affordability is a big piece of it too. I, you know, I know it's not unlimited buckets of money. I totally get that. But you have to say, if I don't give this person that slightly bigger increase to get them more competitive or get them back up to market, are they going to leave? And what is that going to do to my organization when they walk out? But it's a huge, huge issue for many employers right now. Appreciate that. Thank you for the insights. We're all caught up on questions. Awesome. All right. So the other thing about pay equity that I want to touch on is kind of what we're seeing from a legislative standpoint. So we are seeing a lot more regulation come into play around pay transparency. And the way that that is happening is that we're seeing that often in job postings, you are required to post some sort of hiring range. It may not be the whole range for that job. You know, it may not be a one-year, you know, experienced person versus a 20, but what, what's that range that you are looking to bring somebody in? And so Colorado is one of the first states to enact this legislation. And I know so many people who work remote that are like, oh, thank you for Colorado, because now I'm not wasting my time going and looking at a job that I'm nowhere in the ballpark. Either, you know, we're, you know, I'm at 60 and they're at 40 or vice versa. And you know, it's not going to be a match from a comp standpoint. And so that pay transparency piece is often putting out there, what is the rate of pay or a range for that job? Now, I, I personally love it. And I think if you are an organization that is confident and you've put something in place as far as what you're willing to pay for a job, then tell people what that is. I've also sat in the HR seat where I'm the one making that call that's like, hey, Matt, we'd really like to talk to you about this position. What is your salary expectation? You know, let's just cut that time out and be really upfront about it. 
And so as far as the legislative piece of it goes, that really does vary. Um, in some places, it's if some an applicant asks for a range, then you have to give it to them versus you have to have it posted in your job description. I do think it's important as an organization that you know what you're willing to hire for that position and what you can afford for that position to be upfront about it. I, you know, I just I hate wasting people's time, both your internal staff that's spending time on that recruiting process and then for the applicants as well. The other piece is even in that example I just gave, I said, what are your salary expectations? We're seeing more regulation where it says you are no longer allowed to ask, well, what were you making in your last job? And so instead of basing pay decisions on what somebody was making, we're switching that script a little bit to say, what is it that you're looking to make? And then you can see if that aligns with the expectations of what you're willing to pay for that job. And so we'll, I think we're going to see more of that. I don't see these bans or any of these pay transparency rules going away. And in fact, I see that becoming more and more where it's now legislative trying to get um, some impact and make some movement in order to actually achieve pay equity, because we're just not there. Now, there's a whole lot more that we could talk about that and part of it's opinion and part of it's fact. Um, but I, I think from a data standpoint, there is still a pay gap. And I do think that having things like the pay transparency and the bans will help alleviate some of those issues because it's being um, much more upfront as to what we're doing and what we're paying people. And of course, your people are talking. Your people know what each other make. You know, people people are willing to share that. And of course, we can't stop them from doing that. So, you know, I'd rather feel confident as an employer and say, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable talking to you about your pay. I'm obviously not going to talk about somebody else's pay with you, but I want to make sure that you have a good foundation so you're able to have that conversation with them. So pay is huge. I could talk about all that all day, but I'm going to move on. So let's Let's switch and let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do outside of pay. Before I go, Matt, did you have a question or a comment? No, no, I just wanted to say thank you. And I, I, okay. We could talk about pay all day long here as well. Just a quick time check. We got about 10, 10 to 15 minutes left. Here. Perfect. I will roll through these next ones. And then of course, any other questions that come up, just let me know. All right, so let's talk about benefits for a few minutes. So. On the benefit side of things, we have all the traditional stuff. I, you know, I don't need to talk to you about that. You, you know, the healthcare and, you know, medical, dental, vision, all that good stuff. So there's not really a whole lot new happening there other than employers are seeing bigger increases simply because during COVID, we had a lot of optional or not um, emergent things that were kind of pushed off. So it seemed like it was going down. But since we've come out of that, now everybody's going and getting all the things done that they needed to do that they kind of put off. And so we're seeing some bigger increases on, on the healthcare costs. So not really a surprise there. But let's take some of the other things that you can do. So I think one that is really important for a lot of individuals is around time off. And so what we're seeing from organization is that they're being more proactive about giving people time to rest. And so that might be in having PTO or vacation and requiring that people use some of that time. That can also be things like, Let's have Fridays be meeting free. Let's make that a day for you to get caught up on the things you need to get caught up on without the interruption of meetings. You know, even that is a way to, to, to provide some rest for people. I have a friend who works for an organization and they do a Friday off. I would say it's maybe quarterly and it is a true no work day. It's not a holiday. It's not, um, you know, a, a national day. It's not a PTO day, but it is a day once a quarter where the whole company shuts down and the expectation is you're just off. You're not checking in, you're not catching up, you're not sending emails, you're, you know, it is truly a day of rest because they really value, they know people are working hard and they know that you need to take that break. And so I think that's, that's kind of cool. So even if you couldn't do it all the time or couldn't even do it quarterly, it would be kind of nice sometimes, I think, just to have like a true, you know, we're not working today. <laughs> The other part that goes along with that, and I think on the benefit side, is that people need a space to be able to talk through their challenges, and they need to be able to talk through the issues. And I don't just mean that in a mental health way, although that's certainly a piece of it, but it's also having the conversation about, do you have the right tools and the things that you need in order to be successful in your job? And so I think as a benefit, making sure that we're being um, open and being transparent and honest and creating a safe space for employees to be able to ask for those things to be successful is something that we can provide as a benefit that can really help lead to some exceptional workplaces. 
In addition to things like time off, um, other voluntary benefits are becoming a bit more popular. There was a survey done by a group called Voya, and they found that there was a much bigger number of employees who said that they would be interested in voluntary benefits. So that might be things like flexible spending accounts, or that might be things like uh, some of your, uh, think of my words, critical illness, you know, accident and critical illness insurance pet insurance, some of those little extras, more people are looking to some of those things as additional benefits that they'd said, I might actually be interested in that. So the number is increasing as far as what people are looking for and their interest in participating in those different kinds of things. All right, I'm going to move away from benefits just because I want to touch on some of these other areas a little bit more in depth. So the next one is on work-life effectiveness. And notice it's not balanced because I have my phone with me all the time and I have my work email and my personal email. And when I'm doing work, I might have my husband call and say, do you need me to pick up something from Target, right? Work and personal, it's all intertwined. It's not, I'm great at work and I'm bad as a wife or I'm great as a wife, bad at work. Like I want it all. I want to be good at everything. And so that's what employees are looking for is ways to be successful, both at work and in their personal life. And so that's why it's really not balanced anymore. It's just not, it's just not the way that we work with technology these days. When we think about the workplace effectiveness, flexibility is a big piece of that. And so I know, excuse me, I know that a lot of people are enjoying the working from home and some of the changes that came along with that from COVID. But we also have a lot of organizations that are looking to bring people back and have people work together. And so it's important that we have meaningful interaction when we're bringing people back into offices. And so finding out how do people want to work? How do they want to communicate with each other? And working to put that together so that people feel like, yeah, I'm contributing in a way that I'm comfortable with. And that it is also going to help achieve the goals of the organization that I'm working for. People are also looking for organizations to have some kind of stand on social issues. This is something that I think is becoming more important as well, outside of the things like flexibility that we, you know, we've, we've been talking about for years. What I have found, or excuse me, not what I found, but in looking at the data, 64% um, of people said that it's important for employers to take a stand on social issues. And in fact, one in four respondents said they would turn an offer down or not apply at a company if it didn't align with their social values or they didn't take a stance on social values. So it's the same thing. I mean, I, I have places that I don't shop or eat because I don't agree with their social stance. And it's the same thing for job seekers. And people are looking for em an employer that is going to take a stand. Whether you they agree with it or not, that's going to impact their decision, of course. But people are looking. They want employers to be, be authentic when they do it. And that's really the problem is that we've um, seen that over half of people said that that felt like the company's efforts to have a social stance or to address social issues was really um, like superficial and they were just doing it to check a box. So I think as an organization where you have the ability to say this is something that's happening in, in our space right now and in our world right now. This is our view on it. This is our standpoint on it and put it out there. You know, that's a shift where I think people are looking for that. And I think that's going to continue. All right. We're going to go to a poll next, and this is slightly switching gears from where we've gone so far, but I want to know about your performance management process. So I want you to tell me how effective is your performance management process? What, what process? You don't even have anything. It's in development. It checks the box, but it's not effective or it's great. And I'll tell you why, I'll just go ahead and tell you why this one is so important. So in all the things that we're talking about, all of these benefits and all of these perks and particularly pay, we often hear that pay is based on performance. And I bet if I asked a lot of you out there, you know, what are you using to determine increases? What are you determining, or excuse me, what factors are you using to determine if somebody's gonna get a bonus? You would tell me it's about performance. That's why this piece is so important. Because think about it, if you don't trust your performance management process, are you going to trust how pay decisions are made? If you're telling people that performance is what's driving their compensation, then they need to feel confident in that process. And so that's why performance management is really critical when we think about total rewards. Let's see, do we have answers yet? Let's give you a couple more seconds here. 
All right, here we go. So 15% said what process? 17% said it's in development. 52% it checks the box, but it's not effective. That doesn't surprise me at all. And I'm also I'm I'm happy to see that at least 16% said, hey, it's actually great. So when you think about performance management and you think about compensation, they are very closely connected. If you are telling people that you're paying per performance, you've got to know what that performance is. The other thing that I want to say about performance, and this is kind of on the flip side of it, is that I think people are misbehaving at work more and more. I think there's more burnout. I think people are feeling frustrated. And so as employers, and I've seen this with some of my clients, they start to let things slide a little bit and things that maybe they wouldn't really, oh, should we let somebody say that? Should we let somebody do that? Well, it's really hard to fill these positions right now. So we're going to let things slide. But on the performance management side, what you tolerate, you promote. So if you're allowing bad behavior from employees, they're going to see it and they're going to know it. And so think about from a cultural standpoint, is it worth having people treat each other in a way that you really don't want that doesn't really align with your values and tolerate that just because you don't want to have to backfill a position. So think about that from the standpoint of what it is doing to your work environment. And then of course, making sure that when you're making those pay decisions and total rewards decisions, that you're actually basing it on something that's measurable. So performance management really is an important piece of that puzzle. All right, the next one, oops, and I didn't advance my slide. Sorry about that. The next one that I'm going to touch on is talent development. So I had mentioned that the number one reason people quit was because of pay. Well, the number two reason people quit is because there's no opportunity for advancement. Now, to me, those are very closely connected, right? If I have the opportunity to develop my, sc my skills and to grow, then I'm going to get more pay as well. So those are definitely connected. And people are looking for opportunities to grow, and they want to do more. So that might be just creating new opportunities for people to learn new skills. It might be shadowing. It might be offering some kind of tuition or continuing education. And these don't always have to be things that have a high cost to them, but certainly what can we do to help people feel like they have an opportunity to grow or develop? One of the things that I often hear from my smaller employers is, well, we're flat and there's really not anywhere for people to go. And what I think is important is to acknowledge that and to say, are there opportunities where we can expand somebody's skill set in their current role and also accept the fact that at some point, they may grow out of your organization. You know, I think it's better to say, hey, I'm going to have somebody and I'm going to get a few amazing years out of them versus, you know, they're, they're going to be looking for something that we just can't give them. They're going to be wanting to grow into a manager role and we just can't do that. I think you have to be honest about that with, with people because they want it. They want that development. So see what you can do. And if it's simply something that's not going to work, then let them let them grow. Let them let them move on to something that's going to be a better fit for them. One of the things that I see in the media now, and in some of the HR you know articles and blogs and things like that, is this concept of quiet hiring. Have any of you heard of this? I think it's total BS. It drives me nuts when anytime I see anything about quiet hiring. So there's this quiet hiring trend that is essentially where you are upskilling or giving additional skills to the employees that you already have. And it's basically that you're creating opportunities for people to be able to grow as the needs of your organization grow. So maybe you have somebody in a position where that position isn't being fully utilized, but you've got something new. And so you work to shape the existing employees into that position. I hate the idea of calling this quiet hiring. Those are great things to be doing. And I would be doing it loud and proud. I would be calling that like talent development and growth using performance management, using succession planning so that you are growing and promoting from within. And I wouldn't do anything quiet about it. Be proud if you are taking those kinds of actions. So I don't like quiet hiring trend. Grow from within. Love that. Love all the concepts around it, but be proud about it and share that with, with people about your organization. The other thing I want to say about talent development, and I think this is really interesting, is that 51% of Gen Z, so that's our people who are like up to age 25, 26, they have said that their education did not prepare them for the workforce. I like that there's some acknowledgement. I might even say it's higher than 51%, but I like that 51% of Gen Z said, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to be an employee in an organization. 
you know, for some of those folks, that's people who are coming out of school and they did that during COVID. So their opportunities to engage in, in a more thoughtful way, maybe just didn't exist because of the restrictions around COVID. And so I think we have to be cognizant of that, that as we're bringing in workers who are maybe newer to the workforce, that we are really working to create a culture that is engaging and help teach people. I know that we're um, getting close to the end. I'll share a quick story about this. So years ago, I was working with a company and we had an HR team and I was an HR manager. And we had two generalists and one of the generalists was a recent grad, uh, you know, not a whole lot of experience. And so she'd been there just a couple months and her birthday came. And so I stopped and I bought a birthday cake and I brought it in and I set it on her desk and said, you know, happy birthday. And so after lunch, I went over and I was like, where's that cake? And she's like, oh, well, I took it home for my family during lunch. And I was like, okay, that's not what bringing in a birthday cake at work means, right? But I, I didn't even think the fact that, you know, she's, well, somebody brought me a birthday cake and it's a gift, right? So in my mind, I kind of laughed, but this is the kind of thing that when I see this Gen Z saying they're not prepared, yeah, even just some of these things that might be, you know, normal, I think normal, you know, we've got to coach people. And so we just have to accept that fact that, you know, things have been different. Our world has been crazy. So as we're bringing in new, you know, incorporate um, different activities and events, and you may have to do a little coaching and mentoring, you know, what does your workplace look like? What are those cultural norms and help people understand that? When it comes to all of these different things, it's certainly not one size fits all. I do see there is a question, but I want to go ahead and we'll just do let's, we have one last poll. So when we talk about all of these different aspects of total rewards that can be used to overcome some of the challenges, I'm just curious of which is important to you. And I have those, those five different buckets, that's compensation, benefits, work-life effectiveness, performance management, and talent development. So I'm just curious that for you all out there, which one is most important? And I think this also changes depending where you are in your life. You know, several years ago, I might've said like, oh, compensation. And now I would definitely tell you that we're like work-life effectiveness. You know, a big part of starting my own consulting firm was that I wanted the ability to have some flexibility and have a little bit more control over my time. So I think what's important changes depending where you are in life and what you've got going on. Curious just to see what you've got, what happening, happening right now. Yeah, well, we're waiting to, for that poll question to, to fill out just a couple of, of points here too, just to follow up on kind of your performance management comments and just, yeah, a lot of people, what system or it's ineffective, I was surprised by that poll, how many people didn't yeah. think that the performance management really mattered. And one of the things uh, we've seen is like the, the time to recognize good behaviors or, or jobs well done or going above and beyond is always right now, right? We don't need to wait till the end of the year to performance manager to recognize all the successes. So I think yeah. a lot of the things that we have we found we have success with is just taking a moment to recognize those small wins throughout the I year and you build love up that. that goodwill and that, yeah. uh, that feeling of just accomplishment. Yeah. There's a quote that silent gratitude doesn't help anyone. Exactly. So I yeah. love that. All right, you got your poll. Oh, All right, let's take a look here. Okay, so I'm, I, I think I'm probably not surprised by this. So compensation came in with 41%, work-life effectiveness, 46%, benefit, 6%, performance management, 3 and talent development, 5 So I, I would agree. I think that's not really a surprise there. But I think what's important to note is that it's going to be different for everybody. You know, as they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So when we're looking at the challenges, you know, we kind of started with that, where is everybody? So we, we've kind of answered that question. And we've talked about some of those barriers. And then when we look at this different mix of how can we overcome that, it's going to be different for everybody. And I, I think, and there's a comment in the chat here too, um, that's kind of interesting on the social activism. It says it's described as kind of a catch 22. So certainly pros and cons, and it has to be well done and it has to be authentic. But I think even when you tie that in with kind of this mix, it, it's that same idea of what's right for your workforce. And it's not going to be the same everywhere. You know, so you may have to ask people, what is it that they need? Was it th that they value? Because you don't want to be spending energy on things that aren't going to be significant to your workers. It's finding that value proposition that fits what you need as an organization and an employer and what your employees need to come and show up and, and work for you every day. Yeah, certainly yeah. I'll, I'll put in my two cents on those two is I think when you get into some of those, the social issues too, right? It's about um, creating safe safe spaces for people to 
to have those conversations. And really, it, it's, it's not always a, a top-down approach of, of the company kind of shoving its social values downward, but really, it needs to be more employee-driven. So I know a lot, sure. a lot of people have created employee resource groups or other types of uh, committees that can sort of, um, you know, be an incubator for those, those types of discussions, especially when something is happening in the world around us, which clearly enters into our office space and impacts everybody when there's something, you know, horrendous that, that happens out there and, and just creating that space for people to talk about it. Uh, but it is, I love it's that. a challenge, right? It's, it's absolutely, you can't take a position on every single news story and issue out there. That's all No, the I totally agree. On. I totally agree. No, I, and I don't think employers that that's not necessarily their business. You know, sometimes I think that, yeah. you know, companies or celebrities come and it's like, mm, is that really where you're, where you need to be focused right now? So I agree. It, you know, it needs to be something that's very intentional and very authentic, but I also agree that it's really about creating a safe space to say, okay, maybe we're different, but we also can still work together and be professional, even if there are things that maybe I don't like, or I don't agree with. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, Becky, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and for updating us on, on all these trends that are out there. And I, I, yeah, I jotted down some of the percentages and statistics that were, were surprising to me. So we'd love to have you back again next year and, and give us another update. But uh, again, thank you so much. And just as a reminder, this session will be uh, Posted to our website, same website where you registered, so you can come back and catch that. And uh, just thank you again for joining session number six here in our speaker series. And we hope you you come back for more. Please do take a minute to fill out that survey, which we'll launch uh, as soon as we end this session. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, stay safe out there. Thanks.